Right, well done. Um, okay, it is uh, 6 01, and I'm calling this public hearing in order. Um, first, I want to say this is a hybrid meeting, which is in person and virtually by Zoom. Um, so, welcome back, everybody. It's nice to actually be in person after. I don't know how many months it's been, but anyway, it's great to see everybody here. Um, and just to let people know who are on the line that this uh, this meeting is recorded. So anything you say will be recorded. And if you don't wish to have your name or or visage or words recorded, you probably shouldn't participate. Um, but otherwise, it's all good. And if you have any questions, you can talk to our uh, deputy corporate officer at the city. And everything that we do is under the Freedom of Information Protection of Privacy Act. Um, and all these things will be available on the city website within approximately 24 hours. So we are awesome in that regard. Um, so first up, we have several things that we're going to um, cover at this public hearing. And I would just like the deputy corporate officer to tell us a little bit about how things were advertised, if you would, please. Okay, great, thank you. So what I'm gonna do is go to each of these individually and if anybody, uh, uh, Rachel's gonna let me know if anybody up there wants to speak. The first one is the Zoning Amendment Bylaw 2764, P1 Public and Institutional Zone to add leisure facility use. So this will make all things zoned P1 um, to have leisure facility as an approved use. So is there anybody who would like to speak to that? And this will also enable the drill hall to become an awesome arts hub. I'm not seeing any hands up. I'm looking at Rachel, who is? No, we're all good, okay. Now we're going to move on to Zoning Amendment Bylaw 2765. This is 1723 Victoria Avenue. It's going from residential to residential infill. Is there anyone who wants to speak to this one? This is the one that we got a couple of letters about. And there is someone there. Rachel, let them in. Heather, if you're there, you're there. Hi there. Hi there. Hi there. Hi there. Hi there. All right. Well, hold on just a second. We're having a little technical thing. We've got three of you singing in chorus. <laughs> Sorry, folks. It's okay. Stop moving yet. Yeah, Sorry. Okay. Try and hear them. Try and hear them. Oh, we're still getting a lot of repeat. Am I just coming across one time? Sorry guys, sorry guys, sorry guys. Not as easy as it seems. Yeah. So I'm just gonna turn it up and just no one talk and let you talk. Okay, so my concern around the rezoning is kind of safety issue for pedestrian, cyclists, and vehicles. Um, we just live up on Union around the corner from there. And uh, that corner well, the stretch from Victoria and Davies all the way up to uh, Union and Earl, so about a one block stretch, is a little bit treacherous even in the summer just because it's a bit of an S turn and people are always accelerating as they start to come up the hill onto Earl. But if we think about that corner right at Davies and Victoria specifically, if my opinion from living in, we've lived in the neighborhood for 11 years now, when we think about that corner specifically, I think if we were to put two multi-unit houses, so if we assume a primary with a secondary suite times two, we're adding parking for anywhere for four to eight vehicles right close to that corner. In that corner, as you come around in the winter, it ices up a lot. And often I've seen people sliding into the snowbank, so to the right off of the road. So I have a lot of concerns about um, will my neighborhood stay walkable and rideable? And I also have concerns about the safety from a driving perspective. Thank <laughs> you. 
significant amount of congestion at that corner in the last five years, I would say. I just for I have a shared concern about parking and snow removal. Like where are they going to move the snow to? Is it going to be my yard, I assume? And uh, I was I was under the understanding it might be underground parking there. It might be what? Underground parking. Don't know for sure. I haven't uh, heard that, but that corner is extremely busy and it's getting busier all the time. And the, the addition of these two two new houses, I was hoping they're they're uh, single housing, not. I had rumor, heard rumors like of a sixplex and things of that nature. That would be very difficult to accommodate all the traffic in that. <clears throat> That's my major concern. Thank you. Hi, my name's Liz Nesbitt. I'm at 1445 Davis Street. Um, I'm midway up the steep hill and the projected development is right at the corner. I have multiple concerns with this. Um, as was stated prior, that there is a lot of congestion at that corner. Um, I have witnessed so many um, issues with that corner. The stop sign has helped um, coming off of Victoria, but there still is the issue of the steepness of the hill, people going both up and down the hill um, with excessive speeds and inabilities to stop. Another concern of mine is the infrastructure which would be connected off of the Davis Street Hill, where when I moved here 28 years ago, they redid the infrastructure. The hill, since they have been blasting at this property, there are lots of um, faults in the road where it seems to be caving in, including right off of my driveway, um, where there is an actual void under the asphalt that I had filled with foam to try and secure it. Um, that is a concern of mine. How is the infrastructure going to handle it? Also, snow shed is an also concern of mine. The drawings that they have for the proposed two units to go in there. It seems that the roof is metal and it's shedding towards Victoria Street over their garages, over their entrances, how is that snow going to be handled? Is it going to start, are they going to change the design and have the snow shed onto Davis Street Hill, which would be outrageous um, because already we have many, many challenges with snow removal on this hill during the winter months. Okay, 
think we're good. Okay, um, we're going to move to the next one. Uh, to this one. Not seeing anyone. Uh, okay, uh, we'll take a motion to adjourn the public hearing. Okay, Andy and Terry. Okay, we are now going to move into our regular meeting. Thank you for that um, uh, input on the public hearing. I'm calling this meeting to order and we have a public input here, here as well. Anyone wish to speak to us about anything? Laura. Well, good to have you back again. Um, I just want to let you know that the tennis courts have been together, and the schools have been coming out as well. And also I wanted to thank you for having the hazard wood bins at the arena. I think they're really good as I look around and everything's getting cleared up around town. That's it. Thank you. Anyone in the audience there? Let's see. No, I think we're good. No, we're good. Okay. <clears throat> Are going to move on to approval of the agenda and mover. Chris and Stuart, any comments on the agenda? All in favor? Okay. Um, registered petitions and delegation. It is Pickleball Association time. Welcome to both of you ladies. Judy and Kathy, I believe you can introduce yourselves any way you like and have at it. You have 15 minutes. It's quite interesting. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Judy Chrisley Jones, and this is Kathy Goldcock. And we're here this evening to demonstrate a growing interest in pickleball in the community and to show that there's a demand for permanent dedicated pickleball courts within the core area of Roslyn. By raising awareness of the growing popularity of the sport and its benefits to all players, in particular seniors, we hope pickleball courts will be included in future recreational development and be part of the OCT. So I'd like to start by giving a brief description of, of the game of pickleball. Pickleball combines many elements of tennis, badminton, ping pong, and can be played both indoors and outdoors. It is a court game that uses specialty wiffle ball, a paddle, and a specific net. The courts are narrower and shorter than tennis courts, and the game includes four, four players on the court. A, a brief history on, the, on pickleball in Austin. It actually was started in June of 2012 as an indoor sport played in the gyms at the local schools. More recently, pickleball moved outdoors. Players in Rawson were allowed to superimpose tape pickleball lines onto the tennis court out at Red Mountain. This allowed for both tennis players and pickleball players to share the space. The pickleball players had to use the permanent tennis nets on site, which are higher than the standard pickleball net and it does change the game significantly. As well, since there was only one court, it often meant that players would arrive to find that the court was already being used and they would drive to other communities to play. This spring, a group of pickleball enthusiasts approached the city with a proposal to use the existing space at Red Mountain to install two pickleball courts by painting the lines and purchasing two portable pickleball nets while still keeping the tennis court intact. The city complied and the pickleball courts were completed in August. This allowed for more pickleballers to play simultaneously and the group was able to set regular times for play and to encourage new players to get involved. We are extremely grateful for this. We have been able to cultivate a social environment and a feeling of belonging to a club. However, playing out at Red Mountain presents several challenges. The playing season is short, snow lingers in the spring, and snow and inclement weather comes early in the fall. And on Thanksgiving weekend, the courts were icy. 
Sharing the courts with tennis players is not ideal. There are no washing facilities. Some players must drive out the red mountain to the courts and that increases the carbon footprint. And there is a significant infestation of mosquitoes in June, July, and August, which hampers player enjoyment. We therefore urge the city of Rosses to fully explore the possibility of creating an entirely new pickleball club within the core area of town. We'd like to outline reasons to support this proposal. There is a local demand to support the initiative. Um, to demonstrate community interest, we started a Rosses pickleball club on Facebook. And within a couple of weeks had over 50 members who had joined. A lot of the seniors in the community do not belong to Facebook, so that number would increase if we had everybody on board. Um, however, many of the Roslyn players are playing in other communities who presently have better facilities with dedicated pickleball courts, washrooms, and room for players to relax and wait their turn to play. And some examples, Oasis has two permanent courts, Montrose, four. Sunny Hill 2, these are multi-purpose. Janelle has four codes, courts. Trail has a pickleball hub with four courts. Castle Guard has two hubs um, with several courts. And Beaver Valley has plans for courts um, for next year. It's all in place, ready to go. Roslyn presently offers two temporary courts located three kilometers from the city court, superimposed on a tennis court with no washroom Pickleball can provide a lifetime of physical and mental health benefits. It develops coordination, balance, flexibility, strength, endurance, and agility. This sport allows individuals, including seniors, to stay active, socialize, have fun, and maintain their quality of life well into their later years. It is a highly inclusive sport with a relatively low risk of injury. Participants derive healthier and happier lifestyles from their sport and in turn are more active and engaged citizens. Communities also obtain economic benefits from having a proper pickleball hub. Opportunities for economic development and tourism will benefit all. Uh, sorry, will benefit all. Rosin could host competitions and offer offer camps, which will bring visitors to the area, driving economic activity for businesses. If the pickleball courts are in town, the schools could use courts to enhance their PE programs. This was done successfully a number of years ago. When instruction was provided to students um, at Seven Summit Center for Learning, and these uh, lessons took place in the gym of the French school. Pickleball courts have a favorable cost benefit ratio, making them an excellent investment for our community. They are relatively inexpensive to build and can often be built on small areas of existing public parks. The court requires little upkeep once built. In the spring, the courts need to be cleaned and the nets need to be set up. In the fall, nets must be removed and stored for the winter. If the courts are done properly, they will not need resurfacing for seven to 10 years. Pickleball is the fastest growing sport in North America and it's being embraced by people of all ages. As a resort municipality, the city of Rosslyn would be further enhanced by the addition of pickleball courts. They would be a valuable and attractive feature of our vibrant and active community. Financial support is most likely available to complete this project. We have been exploring Columbia Basin Trust grants and the new Outdoor Active Recreation Grant would be suitable for the city staff to access for funding. We have spoken directly to and at length with Patrick Chigamitti at CBT and he assured us that this is an appropriate grant to apply for. Please consider this request for dedicated pickleball courts within the core of our local community with washroom facilities provided. Let's make a pickleball club in Roslyn that will encourage community members new to the sport to come out and get involved, attract many local players back to our town and to our own courts, and entice members from other communities to visit. Members of the Roslyn Pickleball Club would be eager to help make this a reality. We've included a list of contacts that would be helpful if this project moves ahead. Patrick Committee at Combi Basin Trust to explore grants for this project. Mark Baines, Manager of Facilities and Recreation in the Regional District, and Mark has been responsible for completing pickleball courts in the area and is presently working on the reality courts, which will be built in the spring. He's willing to share his expertise and recommendations in this area. And the following businesses have worked closely with the Regional District 
and the completion of many of the FIFA World Courts in the area. Soccer paving, Tom Coast Sport Systems, and Aero Landscaping and Installation. Thank you. And do you have any questions? Thank you very much for that. That's a very uh, very informative uh, presentation for sure. Uh, I do want to let you know we're looking to do a recreation master plan in the near future. So your timing is perfect. I think it's it's really good. The other thing I would say is that we have a very active um, tennis group, and they're the ones that kind of do the maintenance and and do everything on the on the tennis courts. And I'm curious if you think your group would be willing to take an active role in maintaining courts if we were to get them. I'm sure they would. Yes, yes, because I think the maintenance is, is fairly minimal. So, and already, yeah. we've had to sweep the courts every time we're out there, I'll scrape the puddles off, yeah. and that's back and forth. So, I would say yes. Okay, so questions, Stuart? Yeah, I'm just wondering how much of a requirement the bathrooms would be. I mean, I'm, that would be great, but if we have many facilities where bathrooms would be a, be a great addition, but we don't have them because they're expensive to build and expensive to maintain. Why, why, why would this be different than, than any of those other facilities that we provide now with our bathrooms? Well, Pickleball does attract um, seniors, um, and that's been a concern of theirs coming up Red Mountain. Um, you know, having help in the cars and race back home. So, um, and I think most of the Pickleball courts in the area, in fact, all of the ones that I have mentioned, have washroom facilities there. They're either placed by a community center or by another facility that has washrooms that they can share. Probably, that's probably appropriate is if you use the multiple amenities, then mm -hmm. maybe that's the case for it. Or, but yes, that's the standalone bathroom might really up the cost and the barrier of actually achieving this. There are places that do have bathroom facilities already. I, um, just one example is Nickel Plate Park. Sure. Mm -hmm. So if there were a room in that vicinity, that would be really helpful because they already exist. And I don't know if there's any room anywhere else in the community where there are washroom facilities or even skate park. Skate, skate park. park. If there's there is a chunk of land there, it would be ideal. Yeah, be great. And you can position somewhere like that where we can have kids to 80 year olds mm -hmm. in that zone interacting, which I think would be a really positive thing. Any other questions? Andy. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the place. Andy, you're going to have to speak up a little bit. Can you, can you speak up? How do they fit into residential areas? Tennis courts, for example, very close to residences there. Pickleball, I understand, is a louder activity. Yeah, it can be good. We're playing out of Red Mountain, and we've had no complaints as far as I know. Um, right surrounding the condominiums out there. Um, other other areas have to be right across the street, like the trail, the main hop down there that attracts 20 to 30 people in the morning. Um, is surrounded by neighborhoods. Yeah. And actually, is there any of the other ones in the area? There's always houses backing right off of them. And I haven't heard any issues like that. When you refer to the hub, is that multiple parts? Yeah, yeah. So if you have four people playing, um, it's really hard if a group of eight show up. Just trying to scroll through. So it's, it's really nice if you're going to put any in at all, that you have a minimum of two courts that can attract the group. So there's people waiting, people rotating through, and it becomes a really social event. Um, and I think that's important for everyone and builds a sense of community. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you very much. Okay, now we've got some minutes to adopt, minutes of the Sustainability Commission meeting on September 29th, and I'll take a mover for those. I'm going over here this time. Dirk and Janice. Okay, any comments to those meetings? Questions? All in favor? Okay. Then we have some meeting minutes for the regular meeting on October 4th. Uh, mover over here. Chris and Stuart seconds them. Uh, <laughs> any comments on those? Just keeping my head from you know getting too whiplashed here. Okay, all in favor? Okay. Um, we have no referrals now. We've got a request for a council decision, our council procedure bylaw 2770. And this is that we read it for the first, second, and third time. Can I have a mover? Janice and Dirk and some commentary on this. Um, I thought it was uh, it was ended. I know that we discussed with staff the option of uh 
of options for um, more meetings or the having flexibility to have blended meetings such as this one. But I think that uh, the technology chief yet again this evening, you may not quite be able to do that here. Uh, so I think that that would be a great thing to uh, revisit on this policy when we get into a new building that has a little better uh, uh, sound tubing and also uh, broadband capabilities and everything else. So, yeah, and I think that is the yeah. intention. I agree with you 100%. Um, the seconder was Dirk. Do you have another comment? Do you have a comment? Uh, I do. <clears throat> kind of from that, from that little bit, I have five amendments or motions that I'd like to make. I'm not okay. sure. Okay. No, let's talk about it. We're talking about the procedures by and large, but I know how. Um, you should tell us where they are, like what section and what page, so we can find them while you're talking about them. That would be really helpful. All right. Uh, first one. Okay. Um, first one. Page 68. Uh, I move that we add in 1910 uh, that citizens addressing council during public input are required to state their name and address, and 1911, if the content is considered anti factual or harmful to the community. Uh, then the content shall be struck from the record digitally and in public record. Oh. I think we've seen that as an issue with in other communities. Now, misinformation, and it's important to be able to correct that and not be forced into a position to put it online, give it, it seems like, online recordings is the way we're going. I think that's good. I want to know if staff has any comments on that, because I actually think that's a sensible addition. Be all right. Okay, so we could, you could make that amendment. And we could get it seconded and see if people want to. To do them individually? Yeah, I think okay. you probably should, just in case there's some that work and some that don't. Okay, Janice right. seconds it. So, um, Cynthia, you're taking the minutes, right? Do you want him to repeat what he just said? I can email them to you if you want. I've written them out this time. Okay. <laughs> Does anyone need them re? Did anyone need them reread? We understand the intent. Janice is seconded. Any other comments on this particular change? All in favor? Could I, uh, oh, sorry. Could I just hear the hear that again, Dirk? Yeah. Sure. Yep. Uh, uh, we had 1910. Because I think it only goes to 199. But the citizens addressing council during public input are required to state name and address. And in 1911, if the content is considered anti-factual or harmful to the community. Uh, then the content shall be struck from the record digitally and in public record, keeping the record of the citizen without indicating the input was struck from the record. Okay. Yeah, thanks. We would not get in the situation of Dawson Creek. Right. Perfect. Okay. All in favor of this? Okay. Number two, Dirk. Um, uh, add the following locations so to page 59, I think it is. Uh, posting agenda notices, uh, posting them to library, museum, and arena facilities. Um, feeling that we have three brick and mortar facilities, if we could post them there. Uh, can I think you give me the section and a section and uh, I'm not sure it was page 59. Yeah, um, my 59 is, is oh, it might have been in the old 59, and different. I didn't get caught up to the new one. 59, maybe okay. I think it was in the definitions and. Oh, oh, in the I definition think, yeah. public notice. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Notice yeah. board at City Hall, City Hall reception desk, city website, city's electronic newsletter, email list. And you want to add, repeat, arena? I mean, if staff doesn't have a, an issue with it, just... Well, I just I mean, this is an easy way for us to do that. So we're going to go post to different locations. We're going to have to take a staff member or whatever to physically go there and do that. We're relying on anybody that's working for the museum or the library to post our agendas for us. So... I mean, we're fairly accessible now just to find out where stuff is. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a little bit onerous, possibly from a staff perspective. Okay, Stuart. You know, I appreciate the intent to get it out. It's the intent to get it didn't flash out more widely. Mm -hmm. It just seems it's a fairly selective constituency. Certain groups are going to be encouraged to participate, yeah. which is maybe a good thing, but it's not a general. I think my intent was to get it to more facilities, not selective. But, right. yeah, I, I you get them to the facilities, yeah. Yeah. right? Okay. Um, okay. Do you want to make that motion? I'm happy if it's owners to staff. I'm happy to delete it. Yeah. Okay. We'll just let that yeah. one go. What's your third? Uh, let's see if I, I didn't actually number them. I wrote them, but I didn't number them. Um, oh, this was so page sixty-two. I hope that's right. And this was to Janice's point about um, electronic digital meetings or virtual. So the motion, and then I can give you my logic after, was 
uh, that we amend 8.6 to eliminate the cap on the number of allowable virtual meetings for the purposes of work or family absence. Okay, go ahead and discuss it, Dirk. Yeah, the logic, uh, speaking personally, uh, having a young family and being away from work a lot, it is very difficult to get to meetings. Um, I'm, I'm losing out on a lot of work because I got to be back here. And I think that it would open up opportunities to represent the city on council if it were a bit easier to do so. But, you know, like a single parent would have a very difficult time. I've talked to a number of workers that work away a lot would like to do something like this, but just can't. I think one of the challenges is because we're in this facility and now we're no longer on Zoom, yeah. that um, I'm, I'm not sure how well we can pull that off until we get into our new facility. That's Janice makes a really good point. So I'm happy to yeah. shelve that. Okay, well, Janice was your seconder. Let's see what she has to say. Yeah, I mean, I agree with uh, I agree with Dirk that uh, you know creating more barriers for participation on council isn't uh, isn't necessarily a good thing. Um, I think we want to encourage people who have interest and aptitude to uh, participate. Um, but I do think that if they choose to participate, uh, that they should expect to actually participate fully. And uh, and part of that is to attend meetings. And uh, I'm not sure that you know missing more than four times a year calendar year is really, uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily eliminate a limitation, maybe more than four, but not just a free for all. Right. Now um, the comment I would make is that we did do the old call in on the cell phone. I think some people tried it yes. and it was not entirely successful and in some places not successful at all. So, you know, I, I absolutely agree with you. I'd like to see it, but I think, I still think that might be something that needs to wait until we have the new facility. Andy? Yeah, I guess, I guess the reality is that we still have the capability right now. Yeah. It's only one more year. Uh, yeah, well, I was going to ask that question. Could we potentially be in here for a couple of years? No. no. Flat yeah. no. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. That's what I heard. No. That's what I read. Yeah, November 2022. No. Yeah. No. Okay. So, and, and at that point, this can be reviewed, correct? It's going to be. Yeah, it will be for sure. This will be this will be reviewed. A procedure bylaw gets reviewed when a new council comes in. Right. And that is in October. So Stuart. Yeah, I think if it's seamlessly possible technologically, if we can, you know, have a virtual dirt sitting there and participate fully in the meeting, you know, I'd be open to have more flexibility on it. I wouldn't want someone to not attend meetings at all. I think maybe a commitment to attending a significant proportion of meetings is, is the commitment you make when you become a councillor. Right. But, you know, we could discuss the numbers if it was practical for you to do so. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I, I, I'm willing to drop this, given the technical challenge we had in the yeah. beginning. Yeah. And the benefit is the next three motions are kind of related to that one. So I will keep those ones as well. Okay. Here one. okay. Well, you know what? You should share those because they might be the ones that will come around when this gets brought up again next year. I mean, you don't have to share them right now. Yeah. But when it comes up with the new council, you know, it'd be good to have that information. Maybe you can share it with staff so they can have it in their folder for procedure bylaw next time. Okay. So we do have the one and we pass that one. We haven't, we, we just passed the amendment. So now, unless, does anyone have any other comments on? I'm sorry. Yeah. Any other know. comments on anything else you want to say about the procedure bylaw as presented? Yes. I did have one question. Yes. And it talked about in uh, part seven, uh, it's page 51, but I don't think that was right. But going to committee the whole, that you can actually vote to go to a committee the whole during a meeting and then come back. Yeah. Did I read that right? Why don't we? I mean, other than obvious length of time reasons. but is Well, that... the reason we don't do it is because we end up kind of talking like committee of the whole during our regular <laughs> council meetings. So, but so for so some it's... really, you know, much more formal meetings, right, where, you know, you can only speak once, you can only, you know, three, yeah. Most times when we have an issue that's going to, that's actually simple for a committee of the whole meeting, we try to have special people meetings, so we just have that meeting. All right. Because it doesn't go sideways, it just goes uh, very informal, very fast. So they kind of revert uh, regularly to the camera or to the uh, you know, meeting. It's just we just we separate that and do it in the administration instead of our campus. 
Gotcha. Yeah. So if there was something we had to, we could. It gives a little flexibility, but honestly, I don't think, I mean, what have I been here 13 years and I don't think we've ever done it, gone in a regular meeting, go to a committee of the whole and then go back, right? It's just like, eh, why bother? Okay, anything else? Anybody else, anything else? Because we're gonna do first, second and third reading on this as amended with one little addition. All in favor? Okay, and thank you staff, it's, uh, it's a good thing. I just wish we were in a place to get that electronic stuff going. Okay, so now we're into a zoning amendment. This is 2771, and this is for 1992 Leroy Avenue. They wanna to go to commercial um, zoning. And this would be a first and second reading, and then we'd have a public hearing for the 15th. Who wants to move this one? Okay, Terry and Janice. Terry, comment. Proceed to public hearing, that makes sense to me, but happy to hear the public's view on it. Okay. Janice? Yeah, I just think it's great to see that uh, our commercial uh, our commercial businesses are growing and there's a need for uh, more commercial buildings in town. So, um, yeah, I think we should have public input if we have any, and if the public has concerns about it. I think that's great. Anybody else? I have, I have one question, and I may have missed it in the report, but uh, and I know they do $3,000 per space for parking. How many spaces would they be giving us? How many? How many thousands? Four. Okay, four. it's four. Okay, okay, okay. Good, add to that parking fund. Okay, I'm gonna call the question on this one. All in favor? Good. Okay, next up, we have request for decision zoning amendment. This is 3113 Happy Valley. They're looking to do a short-term rental zoning down there. And, oh, this is just for us to provide further direction. I was about to say they were doing a public hearing, but no, further direction. So I have a motion from somebody, Andy. Wait, what's the motion? Oh, the motion is proceed. The motion is what? Proceed with public hearing. Well, no, no, because the public hearing isn't on. We need to we need to do first and second readings and things first, this, right? This was, this so this is an SDR application, right? Yeah, but we're, we the staff wants further direction, which would mean we either like this idea and want well, them to go I forward with it. I have no problem with seeing it. Okay, so the motion is to proceed, proceed to to uh, application. Okay. Formal application. It sounds like that's the process that that counts with the Okay, so your motion is that we're saying we want to proceed with it. I'll yes. take a seconder and then we can discuss it. Seconder, Chris seconds. Okay. Do you want to say why you Just, want to go forward? Yeah, I, I looked at uh, the location and I think it's an argument there a long way away from um, another SDR. Uh, in the circumstance, I think it's good. When, when, the, um, when the policy was struck, the idea of having a single, a single uh, SDR or block was so that we would reduce congestion, reduce uh, conflicts. Uh, I don't think competition was a big part of it, but um, uh, parking and snow removal, some of those things were a high priority. Um, and in this case, I don't see a few uh, those circumstances for which uh, to this particular area so far. Okay, Chris. I, I also agree with that. Um, I only have, I have a question with regards to the, the status of the property. Um, right now, it's like I just drove by this morning and they're putting the roof on the house. So the property itself hasn't been developed. Um, and so the application is for a future property that is gonna be built there. Is that correct, Steve? No, it's for that house that, that is house. being built. And just to go on what the actual motion, there is a bylaw included in this report. So the council could, if they wanted to, give first and second reading to that bylaw that's in the report, which is 2772. And then it could go to public hearing at this meeting if you want. That was the huh. option. So. Well, Andy, do you want to change your motion? Yeah, I'd like to see if this is that point. Okay, Chris, do you want to uh, second that? Yeah, I'll second. Okay, so do we have to vote on our first one and or can we just like change? We're just changing, okay. Okay, so comments on this, Terry. Um, is there a, has there been a precedent set yet for more than, um, so I, I like this idea, I'm fine with it um, for the record, but uh, has there been a time when there's been too short term rental applications within a block or within close proximity? Yes. Now, the, the only one that's in similar town. is where 
one was not technically in the same block, right. but was kitty corner, so was right. generally close. And at that time, council turned it down. This one is a bit different. It is it is technically in the same block, but the block is a long block. So, so are we? Uh, and I, I get the circumstances of the big geography down there that this, you know, for space wise, this is, shouldn't be an issue. But um, are we cracking open um, a precedent? We review them all when they come, right? So these are guidelines. The, the, the one block thing is a guideline. So yeah, cool. and we can justify this by the by the distance. Okay. Stuart. Well, I'm concerned about Terry's point about setting a precedent. I mean, we're going to open up, and we're not going to limit it to one the block. Or presumably, people will take their chances and make their arguments and. We will then be dealing with a bunch of people who would like to have more than one the block. Well, so maybe. Saying, and if they, if they can say they've got enough space for parking and all the criteria that we already apply anyway, why wouldn't we just let everybody have it? Therefore, why do we have a one for the block? Well, I think we can justify it by the difference of the different, like somebody else comes to us with a with a kilometer between the two or whatever it is. We, we can, we can make a, you know, but if we're going to do it, I would rather do it based on an actual chain of policy rather than something that really contravenes it and just saying, oh, well, we're okay with it. If we, we think our policy isn't effective, mm -hmm. we should change our policy. I don't want to make exceptions because mm -hmm. what's the point in having a policy? Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, good point. Uh, Dirk, it just sounds like we did turn one down that did fit the policy, but it was even though it did fit the policy, it was too close. It was too close. It was a precedent for being flexible. Yeah. Um, staff, do you want to comment on this at all? Stacey. No. Okay. Um, who else? Dennis. Well, I was just going to say that our, our policy says that we will uh, do short-term rental applications on a case-by-case -case basis, which, you know, and then has a bunch of guidelines of things we might look at. So I'm not sure that anything we actually do sets a precedent as far as, the, unless it's exactly the same two properties that we're going to have. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, any other discussion, or I will call the question on first and second reading and moving this to public hearing. All in favor? And opposed? Okay, Stewart's opposed. Okay, um, we are moving on to request for council decision, permissive tax exemption for the 2022 to 2026 bylaw number 2773, first, second, third reading. This is just clearing up a clerical issue. So this is kind of a non, non discussion. Janice moves it, seconder. Dirk seconds. And is there any discussion? No? All in favor? Okay, and thank you staff for catching that. Uh, okay, now we have uh, the indemnification bylaw 2775 be read for first, second, and third time. Do I have a mover? Chris moves it and a seconder. Andy seconds, okay. Um, discussion, Chris? No, it looks good. Okay, yeah. Andy? Yeah. Okay, comments, anybody? Thank you, staff. Yes, yeah. all in favor? Okay, uh, regional district appointments that council approved the regional district appointment policy as presented. A mover, uh, Janice, you're the alternate. I'm going to get Dirk okay. to do it and Stuart to do it. Yeah, no. You guys, okay, just yeah, well, yeah, yeah, just because. Um, okay, any discussion on the policy? And then actually, I do want to have a nomination and vote on our RD director and alternate tonight, just so we get that out of the way. Um, any discussion on the policy? None, all in favor? Okay, and who wants to nominate our regional director and alternate? Dirk does, who would you like to nominate? I'll nominate Mr. Andy Morrell. Okay, as the director, and who's the alternate? I think Janice would do a great job. Janice would do a great job. Now, do you two accept these uh, nominations? Yeah, and do we have a seconder? <laughs> Chris seconds, okay. <laughs> what did I say before about smart enough to do the job, dumb enough to take it? Yes, yeah. all in favor? <laughs> Okay. Thank you, thank you people. Awesome job. Yeah, thank thanks everyone. <laughs> yeah. Okay, policy review council information that we uh, approve this policy as presented. Hoover, Janice, 
Come on, somebody's going to second it. Dirt, second it. Okay. Any discussion on this? Same as, same as, same as. All in favor? Okay. Um, policy review, general park trail donations. And this is as amended. The changes are modest, just ways to donate. Mover. Uh, Stuart and Chris, any discussion? First over here, Stuart. I just want to get a sense whether this in any way determines what actually happens out there. Stu, could you drop your mouse just for a second? Sorry. Yeah, thanks. Um, does this in any way determine what happens? If somebody really wants to donate, wants a bench, does that mean they get a bench? Or do we, do we decide what happens and then if we want to donate towards the project, then this is the way they do it? We decide whether a bench goes in or not, right? We, we have that. Mike? Yeah, purely administrative um, in terms of like our requirements uh, to issue implementations uh, as a municipality and not to do with, with the function. So we would hold it you know, essentially in trust uh, or the, the donation in trust, but it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't just like, kind of right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Seven, we're going to get a little more of a bench. Right? Correct, yeah. yeah. So for context, uh, we've used this very modestly uh, in the past. Because nobody donates to us. <laughs> Any other comments? Dirk? Can I put a tiny, teeny amendment? Yes, we can take your mask down so I can hear you. <clears throat> I, can I move that we waive the 2% fee? Strikes me that if somebody is going to donate money, it seems a little... 2%, you know time. what? I totally missed the 2% fee. The word. Convenience fee for doing oh, when card. they use their credit card to donate? Oh. And I know it costs the city 2%, but it's 2% of money that we wouldn't get if they weren't donating. So I feel like the city can wait go, that. Go up for that. Do you have a staff comment on that? Make the donation not subject to the convenience, the inconvenience fee? Anybody? Mike? What's that? Okay, so Dirk's making that amendment. Do I have a seconder? Okay, Janice seconds. Comments on this? Dirk, you commented. Janice, you want to say anything? Well, I think Dirk makes a good point is that if someone's donating money, um, charging them an additional 2% to donate it, and it's money we wouldn't have had, so let's just cover that 2% ourselves yeah. and move on. We can be so collaborative. It's only Stuart. It's only the credit cards. What's that? It's only, it's only the credit cards. It's really just encouraging them not to, not to use credit cards when they want to, when they want to donate. Yeah. Yeah. Write us a check. Yeah, write us a check. Or, yeah, credit card. Credit card. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, but, you know, you e transfer. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to call the question on the amendment. All in favor of waiving the 2% for generous people who donate to us. Okay, and opposed? Okay, we've got three opposed, four in. Okay, um, so that amendment passes. And now back to the policy itself. Any further conversation on that? All in favor of the policy as amended? Okay, thanks. Um, okay, now we have ethics, conduct, and conflict of interest that we approve this policy as amended. And they brought in a lot of good additions from the UBCM uh, committee of the same topic. Do I have a mover? Dirk and a seconder. Terry, okay, comments? Oh, this is good. An excellent sleep aid. <laughs> excellent sleep aid, nice. Uh, Terry, comments? No, that's comprehensive. Okay. It's good stuff, man. Okay. Nice to have it on paper. It's proactive, it's, uh, it's explicit. Yeah, okay. Any other comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Okay, good. Um, okay, reserve and surplus. Oh, I love this one. Thank you, Mike. This is just a great, it's great to see this going. Okay, let's have a mover on this one. Chris and a seconder. Janice, comments? Chris. Well, well done, Mike. Looks good. Okay, Janice. Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's a great overview. It allows us to focus on reserves that need attention. It helps us protect taxpayers from uh, sharp variations in the tax rates. It's a really valuable piece of information for us to have going into the planning cycle. And I think the policy supports um, all the work that the city staff have done on AMPs and, and uh, infrastructure management and uh, surveying over the last few years. So it's a, yeah, very, it's good. I like the policy and it's obviously moving us in the correct, correct direction. Yeah. Andy. I like the idea that, uh, that this is, first off, because there's a public meeting and that um, 
there's a potential that if anybody has concerns about how the city invests and supports uh, you know, its goals, it, this is explicit. We make this you know, some long range planning um, and uh, our tax dollars. You know, I think that the perception that there is that you take the, you take the taxes and you put them right into you know, the operations, the infrastructure that year. And it's not, it's, it's much more obviously with, with uh, how, how our municipalities are meeting to be run nowadays. Um, so for folks that don't have that kind of background, I think it just really explains just how organized and how uh, committed we need to be for the long term. I, I like yeah, okay. this um, the only thing I would ask is in the policy objective, it just has the word leverage in caps. And I'm just wondering if that should be incorporated into that sentence, the city can attain greater fiscal stability, prosperity, and leverage for getting grants or something. Sorry, that was my inside voice. Uh, <laughs> inside there, my apologies. Um, that was my guiding. And okay, guiding so that's not actually going to be there. Okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, I liked it. I liked it. I always, I love leverage. put some exclamation marks yeah. on the end, too. <laughs> Yeah, 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 that's good. I think I had another comment. Oh, you know, I really like the charter reserves, the mins and the max, and it's very interesting to see the areas that we're doing well and the areas that we really need some attention. And I think that's a, a really, it's an excellent tool for council to look at and also for staff um, so we can, uh, you know, put money the right way. The other thing, the suggestion about the police services review, I know that comes up later in the financial plan, but I'm a little concerned that we shouldn't be waiting until 2024 to, to start squirreling a little bit of money away. Like the census says, we were 3,729 people, but the province is already using 4,100 for us now. So I would, I would suggest that we, that we start, if not in 2022, at least by 2023 and maybe even 2022. So I don't know, Janice. Well, on that, on that same topic, I would say that, um, you know, the, the police have just, uh, the RCMP's just renegotiated all their rates and um, we may be looking at an increase in cost, whether or not we're at 5000 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So it might be very prudent to create a reserve that we can put a little mm -hmm. bit of money in there just in case we need it even before we get mm -hmm. to the point where we get uh, to the higher. I, higher I would agree. Of, uh, so would you like us to do a motion when we get to looking at the at the... The draft financial plan. We'll do a, we'll do a motion then and, and talk about that because that's the one thing that stood out to me. Okay, so I'm just going to call the question here because we all love it. Thank you very much. All in favor? Okay, excellent. Okay, now we have the other fun one, the COVID Safe Restart Fund Disbursement Plan. And staff recommendation is that we approve it as presented. Do I have a mover? Janice moves. A seconder? Looking for a seconder, I'm going to say Dirk. Okay, Jenna, start us off. Thank you. Um, I, I just have to say, nicely done, staff. You captured a wide range of comments that come to you. You create a pretty, created a lovely and succinct high-level document that we can all look at and and, uh, and use for guidance moving forward. Um, I really like it. Uh, the only note or comment that I had is, uh, and it was about the opioid uh, supports. Uh, we do have a local business, or sorry, not a local business, a local group, um, Moms Against the Harm, Against Harm, um, that are working on that. Um, and I know that uh, it's important to support our regional partners who may be having more issues than we are, and we're not, we're, not, um, we're, we're certainly having some of our own issues. Um, but I would like to keep these funds as close to home as possible and, uh, and remember that um, every other community and every other region also got these funds to uh, deal with issues that came up from COVID. So um, that was really the only question I had and it's been brewing in my head since then you brought it up and I think it's a great, I think it's a very important uh, issue that's happening in our society that we need to address. Um, to make sure for these particular sets of funds, like trying to keep them um, as within our communities we can. And then if we have a group that is working regionally and so they get dispersed a bit more that way, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, it's good for everyone. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think keeping it as close to home as possible is, is a good idea. Which doesn't mean that we change the number. Just no. As a, and I don't think we need a motion a, on that. I think that's no, just sort of general. Just as a general. Okay. Okay. Dirk, you were the seconder. 
Yeah, I think my only thing would be the, I'm not super keen or terribly understanding of the part-time event coordinator. I think that uh, there's a lot of groups that want to organize these events and they probably just don't have funds. Uh, I think we'd be better off offering funds for the coordination of these events through the organizations that are- I don't know, I hear an awful lot about volunteer burnout. You know, I'm not- um... but I did think about that, but part of volunteer burnout is that you have all of this energy to do something and then no resources to do it. So people walk away. Yeah. So I think if there were some some resources. Yeah. Probably gonna say the same thing. I, I and Chris may have something to say with this, but Emily told me at the last um, kind of heritage meeting where the RCAC is there, UCM Tourism Roslyn and the Heritage Commission, they all asked for some help from an events coordinator. A person, not just money. A, yeah. Person. They said yeah. they need help with that. And they were, I think, planning to come to council to ask at some future meeting. Correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but that's just what I heard. Thank you. you. You're not wrong. And uh, and all of our groups are facing the same thing. So having somebody to to coordinate um, volunteerism at Rossland and, and at least get a spark and get it started. Um, I think the volunteers are looking for some sort of a central place to go at this point. Um, it, it, I think it'd be worth it. Christy. I think the other thing that why it's imminent and, and easily justifiable with the COVID restart funds is that even if those groups are experiencing volunteer burnout before, they're now navigating constantly changing COVID protocols to run those same events. And in the city, like that's, I have to stay on top of that anyways for our facilities and our internal programs. So if we did train up a part-timer to then disseminate that information, I've, I've avoided going there with these events and user groups because it changes so often uh, that it's it's too much for me to stay on top of guiding them through. But if that was somebody's sole purpose, even if just for the rest of 2021, to be honest, we've already heard, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if it's public knowledge, but we've already heard from Winter Carnival that it's very unlikely that they're moving forward. Um, but if we can move forward with this and offer them a staff and a chunk of money together to offset their loss at the ice bar, we may see that that event then will go forward. But otherwise, that's why it's, there's a number under 2021 is because this would start tomorrow. We'd have to get on it real quick to try to help make sure that carnival could happen in some capacity. Okay. Um, I have no idea whose hand was up first, but I'm going to go just start with Andy, then Terry, then Janice. <laughs> so, um, uh, one of the things that I saw with this position, I think is that I can't, I didn't think it should go to the auspices of the city. I thought it should, uh, tourism Roslyn seemed to be, uh, for me, make a lot more sense. Uh, these events are very tourist based and although they're community events as well. Uh, there's no question that there's you know, organizations involved in making money from them as well. Um, I don't see it as a recreation. Um, yeah. a, a lot of them aren't tourist related they're way more community related and i don't know well, anybody I, making I money <laughs> the fair, but, but i think that, uh, we're incredible. I, I don't know i just i just think that when i look at the scope of these activities or these events um it just came to my mind that maybe something in tourism rosin And that doesn't mean we should support that. I'm suggesting that we support it, but how is it elsewhere? Uh, Chris, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, sure. So if you if you look at the mandate in the constitution of, of tourism Rosalind, it's very much focused on the supply side. So their skill set of their staff and their direction is to increase supply, not to work on the demand, or sorry, to work on the demand side, not the supply side. So they're working on marketing, destination marketing. And driving demand to Rosalind, but they're not focused on the supply side or providing a product on this end. It's it's not their staff expertise or or their uh, marching orders. Essentially, the only time that they've switched and, and do focus a little bit on the supply side is with the RMI funds, which the city works with them on, because those funds are specifically pointed towards uh, infrastructure to support the tourism product. And Chris's history in tourism Rosalind can speak to that as well. I'm sure. Yeah, um, it would be very similar in asking uh, the museum to take on the same role or tourism uh, uh, to, to take on the volunteer role for everybody else would be, I think, too much of a, a, of a burden for any one of our, our entities to take on. Um, not 
not saying that they, they can't take on their own projects, but to have, have everything, um, the responsibility of an entity like Tours Mosul might be too, too much of a burden for them. Yeah, I agree. Um, Terry. Uh, yeah, very quickly, I think a coordinator is a great uh, addition to get somebody who's a pro. Well, there'll be common processes for all these different things. You know, there's marketing, and I just remember back to uh, the SC when we had a pay coordinator and how much work we got done. And mm -hmm. it's just like to have somebody who's on the paper on the dime and, mm -hmm. and pushing that stuff uh, is invaluable. Makes a huge difference. Janice. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I kind of went back and forth and just thinking about it. And then in the end, I realized that, you know, for a lot of these groups, it's a capacity issue versus a funding issue. Um, and just giving them money doesn't mean that they actually have someone who can then organize their insurance and organize their timing and do their marketing mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, all the negotiating with the groups, get their vendors and everything else. But if they have someone who can actually sit down with them and say, okay, here are the five things you need to get started. And uh, we have the paperwork right here. Here's the insurance. Here's the road closure for the freight. Here's the here's who you go to this. I think that uh, I think that it will be invaluable to all our groups and uh, maybe even some that we haven't thought about here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, good point. Um, anybody else? Dirk? No, Stuart. I'm fine with the event coordinator. Um, the only thing that stood out to me is a little uh, questionable was the BBC Games plane. Why is that? Which, which one? You see James playing. Oh, because we're we're co-sponsoring the Winter Games with Trail. Why? Well, then we're doing that. But why is that a good use of our COVID funds? Why are we spending fifty thousand dollars in twenty twenty four out of our COVID funds? So we don't have to spend it out of our tax dollars, I guess. Yeah, we need to get into that program so we're paying for it through the city operating the entire this program because it is about a real thing. It's probably one of the first, probably one of the, the biggest things that's going to happen in the city. We're also after COVID and other things. So I think that that's, um, no, we're also looking to maximize this money so we don't make that over. So we're hoping that this would be a suitable fund for that. We've already committed to that. Are we moving to pay the city right? We're paying the same way. We're going to be motion on to do a supporting application yeah. uh, back in February or so. Mm -hmm. so yeah, it's been quite a while. So this is just um, trying to cover that. Where we expect that? Yeah. Okay. okay, any other comments, Andy? So related to that, um, there was in our, in our motion that we were in, we made a financial application to uh, this application. Yes, we did. Okay, and uh, second thing, doesn't uh, BC government pay for the coordination or somehow? It may be not, but there's still a deed of an application. So we split 50 with the city trail, $50,000. Plus, we have also matching um, support and grant support or help with that actually does happen. Um, even though it's up to 2026, that's the bad financial support we come from the, from the operational side of things. But the financial commitment is uh, is due every year in 2024 or maybe the next year. Okay, you know? Uh, the one comment I had, the only thing that I that I felt was missing was um, some, and maybe this can go into our operations budget, but to be able to do something when we, if we get another heat event like we had, and we've got children and seniors that need to get them into someplace cool, like Chris, you so, did with recreation yeah, so a few years ago. Well, and yeah. Unfortunately, we're going to really have a hard time struggling to put that into a cool, cool context because it's about the heat wave and the line of and making the sun cool in the spot. So we have a spot right now. We didn't have enough capacity and get overwhelming support that we would expand that service. And those COVID funds, but to start a program that we have for um, mm -hmm. it's not really related to COVID, it's really deep, so it's really kind of struck. And we have to find a financial report on this and, and so look about that. So, yeah. I mean, we can always keep that in the back of our mind, but really. Well, it is supporting vulnerable people, people, right? It is it is supporting vulnerable people, which is one of the things yeah, that they talk it's about. It's not just vulnerable yeah. people, vulnerable people in the context of COVID 19. Right. No, no. I, yeah, I see where you're going, but I'm, I, I see it more as a stretch to do a couple of the other things than I do that because there's health, there's vulnerable people, there's. We can take a busy games funding. There you go. There you go. Okay. But I still do think that's something important the city should consider because we're going to deal with more heat in the coming years. We've got citizens that don't have air conditioning, we've got vulnerable kids that don't, you know, that, and we have. 
you know, nothing for them. We don't have we don't have a spray park, a cooling park, or you know, anything like that. So I just think we need to keep that in our in our minds. Okay, but otherwise, this was awesome. You guys really listened to us and you put all those ideas in there, and I think it was really great. So no other comments. I'm gonna say we're going forward. All in favor? All right, thank you very much. Well done. Um, okay, so request for council uh, invoices paid for municipal services in September. Uh, we need a, uh, Janice moves it and a seconder. Terry, any comments, questions or comments? Mike is here ready to answer your every sound team question. All good? Everybody good? No questions? All in favor? Okay. Um, Hooper's Bakery Halloween event request. When a mover on allowing them to use the sidewalk. Dirk and Janice. Okay. Um, any discussion? Great idea. Let's go listen to some music. An event. An event. An event. An event. <laughs> okay. No questions. All in favor. <laughs> there's going to be. Some, yeah. There's, it's going to be a special event. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How scary will it be? Oh, it might be really scary. Too scary for you, Chris. Um, okay, this is for information only. This is the 2022-2026 budget financial plan preview. So anybody had, we're going to talk about the police, but anybody have comments or questions you want to ask staff, starting with Stuart and then Terry. Oh, sorry, Stuart. I was no, noticed that the um, sale of City Hall is no longer considered necessary to fund the Midtown. Um, I just wondered if we've considered fully whether or not, under those circumstances, the pros and cons of holding or selling property, whether that's something we should be doing or not. It is a point of clarity from a, from a cash flow perspective. I think. Uh, uh, yeah, we can't hear you. Uh, from, from a cash flow perspective, um, in terms of what we have in our reserves and available to us, if uh, we're not, I can't even, uh, there are no limited cash crunches associated with. Uh, moving like that property, the original uh, the original sale would have been predicated on, um, or sorry, the original uh, plan would have been uh, predicated on like, uh, the proceeds from uh, Old City Hall on the insurance. But we do have enough room to to not have uh, to, to rush on the sale of uh, Old City Hall or to accept any offer. Uh, yeah. Sorry, to further that, the City Hall is for sale right now. It closes on if it just the offer of dealings right now, so we're going to be. Uh, it's going to be accepted until November 30th. We're going to have a review them and then come back to council. We'll probably go through an encountering and have a conversation about that. But my question about you know, the, the need to sell that or if there's an additional thing right now, this is still fully based on the fact that we can use for away some money and we've got some additional some grant and some funding and some other support that we probably didn't know was coming. So the rush to sell City Hall um, is, is kind of it's a plan for us. We don't want to just give that asset away to the we want to change it. So um, we're not in a rush to do that, but before we needed that money to help kind of find the project moving forward, now we're not in that position. Yeah, that's great. That gives us a little more latitude to make sure we don't sell at a bargain basement price. Only top dollar will go. Andy. What was the date again, sort of right? November 30th. Uh, November 30th. Yeah, okay, that's great. Um, okay, anything else? Do we, I had a really stupid question on the on the chart in there, what do all the colors mean? The reds and the greens and the yellows and the... Oh, uh, generally speaking, red is uh, bad and green is uh, better. Um, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm happy, to, uh, happy to, to play with that. I just find a bit more of like visualization. You can kind of see where things are trending and maybe pick up on um, anomalies. So yeah, okay. a green, good, red, bad. Okay. I was looking for like a color key, you know, like the map, you know. The, the, okay, that makes sense. Um, okay. Anybody? Comments? Uh, it was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Great. It's uh, you know, I mean, in terms of reading a budget, it's yeah, very well presented. Thank you. Yeah. I have one as well. Yeah, Chris. Um, and as well, the explanations are fantastic. Um, mine is with our contract with our uh, with our provider for garbage yeah. pickup. Can you put the mask down? Oh, sorry. Mask off. Are we, uh, and the increase between 2021 and 2022 doesn't seem to be stopping. The prices seem to keep going up. Seem to keep going up. Uh, are we going to look at new negotiations with different contractors? Well, we have a set contract for now, Brian. Yeah, so, so we went through a whole review process on solid waste. Um, we had a, we 
and the company came in, we did a review, we did a public consultation. Everyone decided to just keep it as it is. So we, we negotiated the contracts, um, sent an RFP, we got the only one response back. We came in high with the garbage rate fee, so we reduced that a little bit. But that fee, that, that contract was five years, but there is no clause in that because of the fact that we were talking about it and when organic regional comes in. Then um, we would want to also be looking at changing the frequency and or type of, of service we may be having. So, um, you know, right now, for the next couple of years, we're set with those, those prices that we said is going to contract. We're going to, to change that and go over what we're going to be doing for the solid waste, the residential curbside. Um, we could probably get a conversation about that, but I think right now it's, it's kind of set up for five years, which is now probably four years as we did that contract. No, that was Plus, that might figure in with the Bear Smart designation. There may be some other things we want to think about with that too. So we'll probably bundle that all together. I think so. Um, I had one question, I, I, and I may have missed it, but I didn't see anything in there about sort of preparing us for um, the big upgrades to the wastewater treatment plant that are coming down the pike. And are, are you guys talking with RDKB about that and what that loan is going to look like? I have no idea. What the plan is on that. We have provisions built into um, the cost that we have right now to put the little money aside for um, when that jump does hit or when it, when it that jump, whatever, then we uh, we have a contract or we have some money in, in our uh, sewer, you know, sewer place of reserve right now. So we're going to drop on that to kind of um, not get hammered from yeah. year one to year two. Um, so what the numbers that we have, we're kind of Pretty top level for the time being, but once we get a little bit more indication of when that project is going to go, now that we've got the six cent dollars, um, get a little bit more of our funding from our TV with the verified potential plan, we'll look at the time and some of our changes that will be coming. Okay, so that's we're going to have we're going to have more detail on that soon. Oh, good. The funding has been announced, okay. but uh, from the federal government, the provincial government, it's a combination of funds. But uh, as Brian said, there's still details that we wouldn't know enough, but there might be numbers back in this guy. Okay, well, good. Yeah, just we just don't want to be. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, anything else? Anybody? We're going to talk about police. Would you like to make a motion about police reserve fund? I can make a motion that we create a uh, policing reserve fund, a policing cost reserve fund. Is that? You, you can name it whatever you name it and you figure out how much you think we ought to be putting into it when would you like that to start i think we should probably start it uh, in the next fiscal year if we can yeah is that even if we don't put much in it i think we need to start it so it's there front and center so we're thinking yeah. about it yeah let's add it into this financial plan so yeah, yeah, that's the motion that's the motion you get Sorry. cynthia have you got okay? that yeah. okay and who's going to second that motion and you'll second it. Okay. Yeah. Anybody want to discuss this? I think it's a no, done we deal. Covered it mostly. All good. Okay. Are you in favor? Stuart. Oh, say say oh, Stuart, you want to say something? Sorry. Um, I vaguely recall we, we talked about the discussions with, with other communities that are in a similar situation mm -hmm. and there were efforts to perhaps have a more reasonable transition into. Uh, Policing costs. That's right. Was there any? No, <laughs> no. There's no the the, the, the province. The province is the province is looking at it, but I think we're going to get hammered before anything happens. So yeah, Brian. Even um, we were one of the communities that uh, were taking the discussion with the province on this for the other uh, discussions. There was a similar motion. I forget who did it. I think you see how it came up and voted down. Yeah. Exactly what we're talking about. Sit down and yeah. Let us have a better transition from yeah. point one to point two instead of going from, 70, from three to seventy within a fiscal year because the year would be would be a next uh, next census and then year after next census. So no, we might not get there, but as yeah, more stated, I think our COVID state we start funding grant for this actually at forty two hundred not forty one or forty one ninety six or something. So mm -hmm. so from thirty six point seven to forty two ish. Yeah. Six year, four years, five years. Um, we've got way more growth in there, so we're going to be probably at the five thousand yeah. level this year. So it is good to to take a look at that, which is why we're um, 
Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the, the police review board or whatever that we did that thing with, um, they were interested and they were listening, but, and then the UBCM didn't support it. So I, you know, I, I think we're in, we're in a bit of trouble. Stuart. Just so I know more about these things, I'm bring this up. People ask the questions that I don't have, I don't have answers to. Um, does this mean we instantly get a I see a few presence in the community, or is it just <laughs> our, our same poor service? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's the problem. We we pay, we will pay a lot more, and you are supposed to set up your own municipal force, or you're supposed to have some, uh, you know, you you increase whatever's going on at at the RCMP and trail. You you end up paying for another officer. It doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be in Roslyn. I mean, it's just it's a wacky system. Right. So, real quick, the unique situation here is that, um, for example, like Roland and Rosco, like those places that are kind of on their own, they would have their own police detachment, they would just serve more of the community that they're paying for. Yeah. With us, there's a you know, good possibility that we would be adding more additional money to the trail detachment because I don't know if we would have our own detachment here. So, we'd be getting more money, we could lose more money, we probably expect a little more service coming that way. But when push comes to shove, they don't have finance to resources their trucks or no. In fact, I would I would say we're not going to get one. that have made the jump from you know 4,999 to 5,001 or just who just got hammered you know when it happened in Cresta and they I mean they, there were there just there's a lot of problems with it it's a terrible system but it is the system that's there so we have to prepare for it so okay so okay so we're going to vote on this because I think I the vote too early with any more comments no more comments. All in favor of setting up the reserve and thank you for bringing that up. And thanks for the motion, Janice. Okay, so now we have city reports for information. I'm gonna go through these. If anybody has questions or comments, stop me if you've heard this one before. So building permit report for September. Permit, oh, Stuart. That's a lot of line. My question was about the, the $40 million of um, multifamily development, is that? Or part of Okay, building permit inspection by type. Energy code rebates. Yes, Dirk. I just have one question. The renovation. The renovation didn't, it's just not applicable. Is that because they didn't? Go very far. Or they just wanted to get an idea and get the blower test, you know. Yep, and they didn't pursue any of the recommendations. Is what that means. Did, was there a reason? You know, I, I'm not sure. No, that's too bad. Uh, Public Works report September. Uh, water production report September. And bylaw enforcement report September. And so yes. So is the water production performance going to be up considerably over the last five, four, five years? Uh, for, for the months of September, just just a uh, uh, not only there, especially considering when we had such a hot, dry summer, but it's just like somebody everybody turned their taps off. It's kind of interesting. Well, we sent out that we put up you know higher restrictions, right? 
Um, but they were there were some pretty high numbers there, and I think it was June, oh, June, July, and you know until we got to August. Over so. hundred thousand Yeah. Over hundred thousand Yeah. Could this speak to the water farm ambassador? Uh, I don't know which one. The water, could, the water smart ambassador might have made a difference. Maybe she did. We like to yeah. think so. By September, though. Yeah. Um, bylaw enforcement. Comments on bylaw enforcement. Story. Like there was some enforcement. Like there was some enforcement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good job, Jared. Was this is, was this our bylaw officer's first full month? Not his first so month, but maybe in no. August wrapped up in August. <laughs> wrapped up in August. He came here end of July. Okay, okay. so he's Wait. nicely getting into the swing of things. Very good. Right. Please pass on our appreciation. Yes, Stuart. I'll be interested to um, have a short presentation from a bylaw officer and how the whole thing's working out. That's how we actually have a proper bylaw officer and actually. Imposing models, we can see to know and how that's all working out. What would your questions be for him? Oh, I would just like to get uh, a report on his experience, how it's going. How, how, what, 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 you know, this, is, this is a new thing for us. Yeah. Actually, you know, enforcing models. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious how it's all going. <laughs> Cynthia. And do you know that Jerry would like to um, amass more data yeah. as well um, to be able to pinpoint more? trends in enforcement. So um, I'm sure I can get to do a short presentation, however, yeah, yeah, maybe 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 when he feels he has something to talk to us about, and then he can come and we can ask him questions. Has everybody met him? You've been in no. City Hall and met him? No, no. no. Uh, he came by my place the other day. Came by my place the other day and I had a nice chat with him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like a good time. When does he get far? I know he's got it. Not until March or something, right? The, is, when does that car come? Uh, Scott. Be, we're hoping end of December. Okay. When I get the spoiler on the front, I'll put it down and I'll flame it. What? Spoiler on the back. Spoiler on the back. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, the it's, the, it's the flames. Yeah. But you got to wait till the flames are painted on the side of it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll see it. We'll see it when we see it. Um, we'll see it. Good. Okay, any questions on the Midtown construction report for September? Those are coming monthly. Exciting. Um, I, I was wondering um, the framing crews when they arrive. I was trying to look at the uh, schedule. It's, uh, it's, it's quite convoluted and tiny, but um, <laughs> the elevator shaft is going yeah, up. Yes, the, yes, and the, the car, you know, going by. Yeah. The you know, one of the big challenges and one of the reasons that we opted for uh, a spring start, which turned out to be a summer start, uh, was to try and avoid uh, winter as much as possible, winter construction, because of cost of overruns and, and you know, all the challenges there. <coughs> Just hoping we can get that roof on before we get you know, super hammered, but boy, it looks like a long way away from the roof. Well, once yeah. they get going on the framing, I'm told it goes quickly. So that's, we're hoping that that is true. Um, any questions on that otherwise? Oh, yeah. Um, updated task list. Any comments, questions there? No. Okay. So we're two members reports. I'm going to start with Stuart. Um, any report other than that I am in the that uh, I was planning to attend that <coughs> consultation session on modernizing forestry in BC. Um, that you send in there, Kathy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to be able to make that date, but I will provide written feedback to you in advance. Okay, good. Is that it? That's it. Okay, Chris. Uh, Heritage Commission meeting on the 14th. Uh, we're working on some new SOSs for the Trail Wagon Road, Red Mountain Railway, and the Trail Creek Tramway, which was then the Columbia and Western Railway, uh, which would be interesting. Um, as you tour the Columbia Cemetery, make sure you check out the new QR code that we put on the sign. Uh, it's uh, located at the entrance sign, which highlights the cemetery history and contains a plethora of other interesting historical information about our Columbia Cemetery. Um, and October 23rd, it'll highlight uh, the, uh, a walking tour by Harry Measure uh, as a special edition of the Roswell Museum and Discovery Speaker Series. 
um, hit up the museum website for information and pre-registration is encouraged. Um, Harry Measure is uh, a local historian uh, with a ton to offer. So uh, we actually just got the okay from the from the government to uh, for him to uh, do some photography on the uh, stained glass window at the courthouse, which will be really interesting when he's finished that. So he's doing a speaking thing in here first, thing, and then uh, the wall, and then a walking tour. Okay. Yes. And uh, I had uh, and last week uh, the opportunity to sit with the uh, uh, the Arena Society, and uh, I learned a ton about their work. And you know, we talk about volunteerism and, and how things are happening with a little bit of burnout around the room. There, you could tell that they're working really hard and they're tired. Um, so, you know, it speaks a little bit more towards having some sort of coordinator to help a little bit with some things. And that's it for me. Okay, Dirk. Yeah, I was uh, I was at the same meeting with Chris and Janice with the RAS. Uh, they do have a new website, the Russell Arena Society dot org, and uh, or, 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 I can't remember what the conversation was. New logo with uh, this is how we roll. So there's some new fundraising swag coming out. I know they've reached out to Christy and Scott. They're really keen to work in parallel with the city. See if they can help advance some of the city's initiatives through their fundraising. Um, they're keen to continue managing the bottle bin, but not at the school. So the schools asked for it to go away. So I think there's a, if anybody has any great ideas, I think they're working with the city to try to figure out something. Um, still a remarkably good fundraiser, but yeah, they're burnt out from sorting. So uh, I think they put it out there. Any other volunteer groups want to take over the bottle bin for some time to? They'd be happy to relinquish that. They sent it out to 50 nonprofit groups in okay. our area. Um, uh, I think there's just some, let's see, one question that they had, which was good for me to think about, probably all of us to think about, is how we measure the success of a uh, facility. Uh, I don't think they're looking for any answers, but just some a good question to think about. Uh, they're going to be added to the email list of users. Um, because they're a really good kind of outreach, they're trying to disseminate. They, 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 what was that? Uh, the to get use them as disseminating information about uh, opening, closing, that kind of stuff. Okay. A lot of people ask them a lot of questions, and then they're considering doing a survey of the user groups to come back to us with a delegation of some kind. Um, I didn't make the ETF meeting because it was at the same time, but they're looking at doing a series of energy talks in the new year featuring pros and cons and lessons learned of uh, deep energy renovations. Um, there may be some photos of my house in one of those. Um, looking at some uh, interesting ways to encourage the free bus to the ski hill to once again be a free bus. So I was chatting with Matt today about some of his ideas uh, Hopefully something can happen and be presented soon. Um, fundraising and uh, uh, looking for more volunteers. Everybody's looking for more volunteers. So if there are volunteers, and then just a small personal update on my side is my chickens are now electrified. <laughs> good. <laughs> but do they glow in the dark? Yeah. All right, good. And that's it for me. That's it. Janice. Uh, Stu, actually, if you can't make that um, forestry, modernizing forestry I was looking at, but I assumed you were going, I'd be happy to. Uh, I have an opening that day. So I'd be happy to. Yeah, it, everyone's uh, invited. Like, yeah. I think I sent that around to everyone. So mm -hmm. just sign right up. Right? Yeah. I'm, I'm probably going to um, be there too. And on the same note, I did sign up for the seminar that it's not my dad's landfill anymore. Oh, I didn't see that you one. You didn't see that one? No. Who's that doing that one? From. There's a seminar about. Um, Landfills, it sounds really exciting. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to go to that one. Get so, dirty. Because that one is not my dad's. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, on October 6th, I attended an economic development task force meeting with Ross and Tourism, which was very interesting. Uh, the task force is continuing to gather information and explore opportunities with all the regional economic development entities. They're planning on presenting an update to council. Mm. It may not be before the end of the year, it could be early next year, um, just to give council an idea what they're looking at, what's risen to the top, what they found out, uh, and where we stand. Um, October 13th, along with uh, Kathy and Chris, we attended a Midtown Project uh, update meeting. Project is about three or four weeks behind currently. The general contractor uh, does believe that he will be able to, that they will be able to make up that time over the course of the next 12 months. 
and they um, did feel that they would be able to get the roof on in December, maybe just not the very beginning of December. So they anticipate they will have to deal with some snow load at some point, uh, but they are still pretty confident that they can get it closed up so that they can work on it through the uh, through winter. Uh, supply chains, of course, are a general concern for construction for everyone this year, uh, but thus far, um, all the supplies and materials are arriving in a timely manner, so there's no hold up at that end. Uh, rock on wood all over the place uh, from any supply chain issues for that project. Um, and then on October 13th with uh, Chris and Dirk, I also attended with the uh, Arena Society, a great discussion. The Society is meeting with staff later this week uh, to move forward. And uh, yeah, it looks like they're very excited as everyone is about to have the arena up and running and booked and doing things again. So that's all I got. Thank Great. you. Terry. Well, I'll just let me segue on that. And, and on a personal note, uh, great to be back playing hockey again. So I know there's a lot of happy people out there at the ice, so it's great to see that. October 6th, uh, library meeting. Um, they too are tickled to be face to face with the public. Um, lots of programming things, youth elections, indigenous book clubs, and collaborating with the museum. October's Library Month, they're doing a bunch of promotions there. And if you've got books to donate, you get a tax receipt for that. So spread the word. And they are also looking for board members. So that's, uh, that's on that. And they were excited to get the green light from us on the library, on the little library thing. So they're working away on that. That's what I got. Okay, Andy. Uh, uh, board meeting on October 13th. Uh, report, uh, written report coming up uh, soon for that. Um, I've been involved in the uh, RCC Regional Connectivity Committee. It used to be CBCC? CBC? CBBC. Something like that. Columbia Basin Broadband, Broadband Corporation. Corporation. Right. So this organization um, is a lot more um, regionally based. Uh, well, you know, more Columbia, Columbia. That's what CBBC was. Did it they dissolve? However, what's unique now is there's much more uh, uh, representation. Two representatives for every organization, every regional district, every district uh, sorry, every regional district. So we actually have two representatives, both Ann and I sit on this committee. Um, and that, that is, I understand, previously is only single representative. So did CBBC dissolve? No. Okay. This is a this is a CBC was mostly related to CBT. Yeah. Where this is uh, called the Regional Connectivity Committee that includes CBC. Ah. Okay. So um, they, it's all the way to here. Maybe maybe on the east, maybe right out into the top of the corner. Um, so interestingly, they have put a, I think I mentioned this in the previous great report, uh, there's a $92 million project to connect uh, 6,600 homes and a grant application as in with uh, the federal government uh, for a uh, huge amount of money, millions and millions, tens of millions of dollars. Um, and hopefully we're going to hear about that in the new year. Uh, I sat in on uh, a meeting with uh, our MLA's uh, Roy Russell last uh, uh, last week. And there's a real effort now to get because this application is sitting there in 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 the government's hands, uh, really pushing the initiative now, trying to get support. So we're contacting all our MLA's, our member parliaments, uh, and keys all across the region to try and support. Uh, today I sat in. I was over in Castle Guard this morning, setting a three-hour um, workshop with the so with the uh, connectivity committee. Uh, it was really good. Uh, it was a hybrid meeting with people zooming in all the way from uh, well, even Victoria, to be honest, a couple of government officials as well. Uh, but uh, it was at CBT and Castle Guard, and just to reaffirm and review the goals of the organization. And obviously this is a big project, uh, but also it's an opportunity to celebrate many successes. Uh, a couple of them are kind of unique. The, right now, they're looking at uh, expanding connectivity all the way up to Spokane Valley. 
It's a really neat project. Uh, they, they're actually ahead of time-wise and ahead of budget. So there's fiber optic going all the way up to mm -hmm. Valley. It includes uh, three different methods of transmission. It's, there's underground, there's overhead using poles, and there's also submarine cable. Mm -hmm. So Spokane Lake and uh, Summit Lake are using submarine cables to provide service all the way across. So it's pretty crazy to see these kind of projects going right ahead now. So Andy, this is all for very rural communities. None of this, none of this grant in, involves less. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. Um, but it does. I mean, connectivity is a big issue everywhere. And mm -hmm. So uh, they're advocating connectivity at all levels, mm -hmm. and recognizing uh, that we need to continue to expand. I uh, understand as well that this is because they're not the case. Um, there is a project in Roswell that ran the works through the ballot. It's the fiber across the Cascade Highway. Uh, that project is running in some stumbling blocks, but it's supposed to have has started. I don't know what stumbling blocks are. I don't know what that. Um, but any, anyway, it's just interesting uh, to, to hear just how much is being done. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, just with, with Roswell. Uh, there was discussions around how much um, people are taking advantage of the fiber. Mm -hmm. There were down down board. There were questions specific to you know what's what business is signing up that of course that's not the case. Mm -hmm. um, so I have no idea actually. I don't know what the uptake has been on on broadband for downtown. Um, generally, most people have decided not to, to connect to the fiber that's there. And where are you getting that information? That's coming from CB. I'm interested. Yeah. Well, they have two resellers, as well. mm -hmm. two entities that do the work to hook you up to their right. Yes. 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 yes, secure by design. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I wonder if it's a. Uh, I, I wonder if it's a awareness issue versus a reluctance to sign up. It's a cost issue, and it's of course. A lot of the plans and a lot of these big projects are bringing infrastructure in, but they're not connected to the whole mm -hmm. business directly. So that's where the ISPs get involved, the individual mm -hmm. providers. But it's also expensive to, to, to provide that last mile service they call it. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's exciting to see that level of connectivity uh, being available, but the challenge is still. Choose to sign up. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Good. Anyways, uh, yeah. Okay. You've been busy. Um, okay. So I've got a couple of things. Participating with Spencer Andres from City Spaces at an FCM conference this week called Sustainable Communities. And we're on a panel talking about um, our project, our MCOM project. Um, Spencer's got the slide deck. I think I'm just there to. I don't know why I'm there. Actually, I'm not presenting anything, but they wanted they wanted somebody from the city on the on the panel. So, um, and it's talking about the panel is funding and municipal support for affordable housing initiatives. And because our project's unique, being a city hall and affordable housing, they're interested in that. Um, spoke with a couple of people from Deloitte who are gathering information on broadband deployment, and they're doing it for the Northern Trust. Um, they're also working with the Minister of Citizen Services, and they were interested in how our, our downtown broadband got started, which goes back to CBT kind of doing it as a pilot project many years ago. Um, attended the Midtown Monthly Project meeting, got the report. Uh, I met with the new Bear Smart Community Group members, and they're interested in how they can help move Roslyn forward to get the Bear Smart designation. And that's one of the things that's important when we get working with Wild Safe is to have the community on board. And it was great. There were like, there were 15 people who were invited and 12 of them showed up. So that was, that was pretty good. Um, I'm just thinking, I'm hearing all this stuff about the, the lack of volunteers. You know, we did that Discover Roslyn event um, a couple of years ago. And I've had a number of people say, oh gosh, we should do that again. And I was planning on doing it fall of 2022, but I'm wondering if uh, COVID uh, cooperates, maybe we should try and move that up and do something in the spring to try, because people did, a lot of the groups did get new volunteers from that. So, you know, maybe we'll, we can, we can talk about that and see if that's of interest, but of course it depends on 
you know, whole horde of people in here. Um, I had a conversation with people at Mercer Selgar. They're looking for support for a letter to the premier. It's talking about the advances they can make um, to chop down the trees faster for their, for their plants. Anyway, it's gonna come to us um, and we'll have a discussion about it. Uh, they have some good ideas, you know, to be more cost effective, but they have some other ideas that seem a little iffy. So we're gonna have to see about that. Um, had a call with the interior mayors and regional district chairs with Minister Osborne, Minister of Municipalities and the new president of UBCM, Lorianne Rudenberg. Um, and it's, it's really good to have this opportunity to touch base with them and they do it every month. And that's, I think that's been a really good thing that came out of COVID because first with Selena Robinson, she started it. Uh, Minister Osborne has kept, has kept it going. Um, and it's just great for the municipalities to hear what everybody, everybody else's opportunities and challenges and for the provincial people to hear that. And, and uh, Minister Osborne brings different people in every time. Sometimes it's somebody from the health ministry or somebody in, you know, UBCM or somebody in some other, you know, citizen services, whatever it is. So that's pretty good. Um, I did send around the list of council committees. If anybody wants to change. Janice made a good suggestion about liaising with the Chamber of Commerce who maybe needs some, some uh, influence, you know, perhaps, and maybe there's a tie-in with Tourism Roslyn. So I don't know if Tourism Roslyn rep wants to also get on the Chamber or you want to horse trade some committees, but let me know because we need to get that into place pretty much right away. So review that list of your committees. And if you're keen to make a switch, get cross-trained or, you know, share the wealth of involvement, you're welcome to do that. And that is it. So unless anybody has anything else, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. Okay, we're done. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so did we put everything away? That was We've got a coming in again. Christy, all the tables are just against the chairs. <laughs> okay.